Um, good morning, everybody. I'm Robin Bigelow. I'm a second year fellow at the House Ear Institute. I'll be presenting today about um, surgical management of Meniere's disease from the past to the present. I have no relevant financial disclosures. Here are the objectives of the talk today. We will first be discussing some historical background on Meniere's disease. We'll then take a look at the interesting treatments that have been used for Meniere's disease over the last 100 years. We will review the current literature on surgical therapy for Meniere's disease, and finally discuss the house clinic experience with endolymphatic sac surgery. We will start with a few early descriptions of what may have been Meniere's disease. In his personal letters, Martin Luther wrote a peculiar set of symptoms that troubled him greatly. He thought the devil was haunting him, and he was reported to have thrown his inkwell across the room in frustration. Here I quote a summary of his ailments. While we cannot know for sure, the variable tinnitus and vertigo attacks he experienced sound like it could have been Meniere's disease. It began with roaring tinnitus of the left ear, which increased dramatically and seemed to occupy the left half of his head. Then a state of sickness and collapse followed. However, consciousness was retained throughout the whole period. After a night's rest, all the symptoms had subsided, except the tinnitus, which from that day on continued for the following years in varying intensity. Similar attacks with increase of the tinnitus and vertigo as the leading symptoms seized him at irregular intervals and distressed him extremely. I'm sorry, Robin, who, who was that? Oh, okay, uh, I got it, okay. Martin Luther. Yeah, see, yeah. Um, famous for the 95 Thesis and uh, Protestant Reformation. Uh, another famous person who probably had Meniere's disease is Jonathan, Jonathan Swift, a satirist and author from the 18th century, known for Gulliver's Travels and a Modest Proposal. He wrote, I got my giddiness, then I got my deafness, and these two friends, one or another, have visited me every year since, and being old acquaintances, have now fought, thought fit to come together. He goes on to describe the treatment recommendations of physicians of the day. Their prescriptions included, and I'm quoting here, Herbs, minerals, gums, oils, shells, salts, juices, seaweed, excrements, barks of trees, serpents, dead men's flesh and bones, birds, beasts, and fishes to form a composition for smell and taste the most abominable, nauseous and detestable that they can possibly contrive. Needless to say, he wasn't particularly impressed with the um, physician's care he had in the day. Historically, vertigo, or an abnormal spinning sensation, has been described in the earliest medical texts dating back to ancient Egypt and Greece. In the past, vertigo was thought to be a form of a seizure or stroke, which was related to changes in blood flow in the brain, and was not thought to be related to the ear. Then came Prosper Meniere. He was born in France in 1799. After completing medical school in Paris and being passed over for a prestigious job at the university, he was appointed director of the Institute for Deaf Mutes in Paris in 1938 with no prior training in otology. He died in 1962, which is one year after his famous contribution to otology. He was more than just a physician, however. He was also the vice president of two botanical societies. He wrote several papers about orchids. He studied and published on the medical knowledge of Greek and Latin poets. He was well known in French high society and a lover of opera and literature. Much like many doctors today, he was forced to be busier clinically than he wanted to be. And he was quoted as saying, I saw more than 20 patients. I worked, I talked, and I found time short until evening. In, 19, in 1861, Meniere gave his landmark presentation to the Imperial Academy of Medicine in Paris. He argued that vertigo was not due to cerebral or brain problems, but was in fact linked to hearing and was a result of inner ear disease. As evidence, he cited cases of vertigo and hearing loss after penetrating ear trauma, um, an autopsy he performed of a young girl who had vertigo and hearing loss, um, who was found to have blood in her inner ear, but not in her brain. He also described the symptom complex now known as Meniere's disease, in which there's episodic vertigo, tinnitus, and hearing loss. In those patients, he found vertigo stopped after the hearing loss was complete and was no longer fluctuating. Here's a translation of Meniere's original description of the symptom complex now bearing his name. He has four main points. That in a certain patient, tinnitus is associated with hearing loss. Hearing loss and tinnitus are associated with vertigo and nausea. Vertigo spells are followed by worsening hearing loss. And the cause of this disease is the inner ear. 
Meniere described the treatments offered to patients at the time, including quinine, dyspeptic treatments, iodine, and sulfur water or Turkish baths. Several procedures were offered, including bleeding or leeches, a seton in the neck, which was an attempt to generate pus and draw out bad humors, or muxa, an ancient Chinese remedy of burning scented cotton near the skin to balance hot heat and cold inside the body. Meniere himself didn't much believe in the value of these treatments. He's quoted as saying that the condition was not one of those where art could usefully intervene and that a rigor of treatments as uncomfortable to the patient as it was futile, a violent therapy which not only harms the patient but also causes him to doubt the intelligence of his physician. It seems like Meniere, um, as a physician, was um, understanding of Jonathan Swift's, Swift's troubles with physical care of Meniere's disease at the time. His theory connecting the inner ear to vertigo and describing the symptom complex, which is now known as Meniere's disease, was very controversial after it was presented and for decades after his death. Contemporaries noted inconsistencies in his published accounts and claimed incorrectly that he attributed Meniere's syndrome complex to intralabyrinthine hemorrhage, when he was in fact using that case as an example of proof that the inner ear was involved in vertigo, not necessarily the symptom complex. For decades, any type of rotary vertigo could be described as Meniere's disease, a misnomer which I still see today sometimes in clinical practice. There's also controversy as to whether or not um, this man pictured here had Meniere's disease. Vincent Van Gogh, um, in his letters, many of his descriptions of his fits or attacks sounded more like vertigo than they do of typical epilepsy. And he famously cut off his ear due to auditory hallucinations during a mental health crisis, which may have been due to tinnitus. There have been several papers in the past 30 years debating whether or not he had epilepsy or Meniere's disease without a clear conclusion. So what is Meniere's disease and how do we think of it today? I thought this diagram was too good not to include. It is from a paper in the 1960s showing a patient with Meniere's disease. You can see their head spinning and their eyes zigzagging to represent vertigo and nystagmus their hand held up to their ear to demonstrate hearing loss, a metal band around their head representing ear and head fullness, and a musical band, which they labeled as the Beatles, demonstrating tinnitus in the ear. Here are the current diagnostic criteria for Meniere's disease. Um, patients have episodic vertigo lasting 20 minutes to 12 hours, a low to medium frequency hearing loss, and fluctuating hearing, tinnitus, and or fullness in the ear. Here's a characteristic audiogram appearance of a low pitch hearing loss, which was published in Walter Dandy's 1982 paper on eighth nerve section for Meniere's disease. More on Dr. Dandy later in this talk. How common is Meniere's disease? It's actually fairly difficult to tell. Um, a number of papers have been published. I think the best one suggests a prevalence of 190 per 100,000 of the population, or about one in 500 adults similar in prevalence to lupus or MS. The range is large, however, and other reports estimate a prevalence of 3.5 to 513 per 100,000. Now we will talk about some of the treatments options for Meniere's disease. I love this quote. The number of treatments available for a condition is inversely proportional to the success of those treatments. This quote comes from a giant in our field, pictured here on the right, Dr. Gerald Bracklin. We will now discuss some of the treatments that have been tried for Meniere's disease over the years. As a proud Johns Hopkins alumnus, I don't think this talk would be complete without a brief mention of William Osler's textbook, Principles and Practice of Medicine. Pictured here are the four founders of Johns Hopkins, including William Osler in the middle. In this, his textbook, there's a section on Meniere's disease in which he recommended potassium, iodine, salicylates, and or quinine. In a contemporary ear-specific textbook by Edward Dench, we see a more procedural treatment for Meniere's disease. The author recommends bloodletting from the mastoid tip with a wet cup. For those of you who don't know, cupping is an old remedy in which heated cups are placed on the skin, which creates a negative pressure, pulling out bad humors or energy. Wet cupping is when a cut is made in the skin under the cup to allow blood to fill the cup. This is available today, as you can see in this um, kind of gruesome picture, of a gentleman on YouTube doing wet cupping on his scalp to improve hair growth. In the early 1900s, there were a number of surgical treatments attempted for Meniere's disease as well. 
1902, Dr. Perry described a middle fossa approach for ape nerve section, which was unfortunately complicated by facial paralysis and two reported mortalities. In 1903, Dr. Crockett removed the stapes in several Meniere's patients, which improved the dizziness but led to deafness, not surprisingly. In 1904, Drs. Milligan and Lake did an early attempt at chemical labyrinthectomy by opening the semicircular canals and injecting antiseptic. Dr. Babinski, the same neurologist who described the Babinski foot reflex, among other things, recommended lumbar puncture with drainage of CSF for many years, which he wrote was moderately successful. Jenkins published decompressing a horizontal semicircular canal, which he also claimed was effective. In his 1914 textbook, Dr. Ballinger distinguished between Meniere's disease, which was described more like modern thinking of labyrinthitis, and Meniere's symptom complex, which he describes as dizziness, nausea, and tinnitus with fluctuating deafness and recurrent symptoms. For Meniere's symptom complex, um, he advised applying pressure to the tympanic membrane. He recommended using a rubber tube from the mouth to the ear canal, and then using the mouth and lungs to generate suction and pressure to the ear. Alternatively, he said you could use a pneumatic otoscope to generate pressure on the ear. This idea of changing ear pressure from near disease eventually led to the development of the Meniet device, which was used and subsequently discarded in recent decades. In a 1926 textbook, Dr. Balin recommended cold compresses to the head and frequent sponging of the body, he recommended administering mild purgatives, among other things. Similar to today, he also recommended a strict diet with no caffeine, tea, or alcohol. He also recommended an intratympanic injection of iodine, which was done through the eustachian tube. Electric treatments for various conditions were in vogue at the time and continue today in the form of ECT and transcutaneous magnetic stimulation, or TMS. TMS is used for tinnitus today in some centers. For Meniere's disease, they recommend a mild current applied to the head. Some recent studies of the vestibular system's function and impact on the body use galvanic vestibular simulation, in which the vestibular system is activated using electrical current applied to the mastoid. In 1926, George Portman published the first endolymphatic sac surgery for Meniere's disease, reporting a great success with two patients. At the time, there was a growing understanding of glaucoma um, that it was caused by a pressure in the eye, and Dr. Portman thought that Meniere's may be similarly due to pressure in the ear. He sought to relieve that pressure by decompressing and opening the endolymphatic sac. He performed a posterior-based mastoidectomy using a gouge, shown here, and then identified and decompressed the sigmoid and posterior fossa plates to identify the endolymphatic sac, which was decompressed and gently opened with a needle. Today, the instruments are different, but the surgical steps are roughly the same. Walter Dandy was a famous neurosurgeon at Johns Hopkins where he had many important contributions to the field. For Meniere's disease, he advocated for eighth nerve section, which is still performed today. His preferred approach was a suboccipital craniectomy, often done under local anesthesia. The diagram here shows the approach and cutting of the nerve. When he performed bilateral eighth nerve sections, the patients were left with persistent dizziness, which came to be known as Dandy syndrome, or vestibular, bilateral vestibular hypofunction. In his first 401 cases, he reported only one death. However, not all neurosurgeons had such favorable results. Up until this point, there was very little known about the pathophysiology of Meniere's disease. It was localized to the inner ear, and Portman and others had a theory it was a form of oral glaucoma related to pressure and imbalance in the inner ear. However, there were no pathologic descriptions of Meniere's until 1938. Dr. Hallpike, the same physician more well known for the Dix Hallpike maneuver, collaborated with Dr. Cairns and performed a detailed temporal bone autopsy on two patients with Meniere's disease who died as a result of complications from vestibular nerve sections. Prior to this, there were no good pathologic descriptions of patients with Meniere's disease since the disease itself, while debilitating, was not fatal. These pictures are from the original manuscript and demonstrate here normal cochlear anatomy and then the abnormal anatomy on the diseased ear here demonstrating the characteristic endolymphatic high drops. A number of other destructive procedures for the ear were tried in the coming decades. In 1935, Dr. Wright injected alcohol through the tympanic membrane and oval window. Mollison modified this to inject alcohol into the horizontal semicircular canal as depicted in the diagram on this slide. Dr. Cawthorn described a transmastoid labyrinthectomy 
and Dr. Goodyear and they recommended electrocautery to destroy labyrinthine function. Passy and Seymour advocated for division of the stellate ganglion and sympathetic trunk. They described their series of 12 patients with Meniere's disease with favorable results. They also recommended ligation of the vertebral artery, stating that this was necessary to eliminate any nerve fibers that ran with the vessel. Their paper mentions the theoretical risk of a pica stroke, but that it is unlikely to happen in a typical Meniere's patient who is younger and doesn't have vascular disease. Contemporary commentary on their technique and other papers and textbooks were critical of the recommendation to divide the vertebral artery, stating that the risk of stroke was too high to justify the risk. Vertebral artery ligation did not take off as a treatment option, but sympathetic neurectomy did continue for several years. In 1951, a team of doctors published on the use of trans-tympanic injection for Meniere's disease. Today, we inject corticosteroids or gentamicin directly through the tympanic membrane, as shown in this um, diagram from the original 1951 paper. In 1951, they were injecting a mixture of cocaine, tetracaine, and alcohol. This was done with the eustachian tube plugged to ensure that the medication stayed in the middle ear. The patients would develop vertigo, nausea, and vomiting approximately 20 minutes after injection. I wanted to highlight the results section of their paper here, which is no more than one sentence. Um, it's remarkably non-descriptive, but elsewhere in the paper, we note that both tinnitus and vertigo improved in about half of the patients. While the details in the results section of this paper are extremely lacking, the authors do have a very detailed description of the operative procedure and describe some other animal work demonstrating that medications applied to the middle ear can diffuse through the round window, but not the oval window and those medications can impact inner ear function. This is an um, important step forward in our field, demonstrating a way that drugs can be delivered directly to the inner ear. Another treatment from times past, the frontal lobotomy, a paper from 1965 that describes a series of 20 patients who had a frontal lobotomy for tinnitus. The article notes that the majority of these patients had Meniere's disease, although details on the demographics are limited. Of the 20 patients, eight improved, 11 had no change in tinnitus, but they report the symptoms bothered the patients less, less, and there was one mortality. In describing the results from one case, the authors note, and I'm quoting here, the head noises were the same, the depression was about the same, and there was marked personality defects, such as tactlessness, spitefulness, selfishness, and irresponsibility. Nonetheless, the patient and her husband both said that they were glad she had had the operation. She was glad because she no longer worried about the head noises. He was glad because she no longer inflicted her misery upon him. Around that time, another of other, a number of other procedures were done to manage the dilated endolymphatic system. This diagram comes from a nice review of this history by Brian Ward. In the fermentic shunt in the top left, the horizontal canal and membranous labyrinth were accessed and routed into the mastoid. In the fixed sacculotomy, a needle was placed through the oval window into the vestibule to rupture the dilated saccular membrane. And fixed paper is where we got that great diagram from earlier showing the patient with Meniere's disease. The TAC operation was similar to fixed sacculotomy, but a TAC was left in the ear. The goal would be that every time the saccule was dilated, it would balloon out into the point of the TAC and be punctured allowing for repeated openings of the endolymphatic space without recurrent um, procedures needed. A cochlea sacculotomy is another procedure and involved putting a right angle hook into the round window. And a periodic shunt involved placing a platinum tube into the scala media. These procedures all had variable and generally favorable reported success rates, but they did not stand the test of time. In 1962, Dr. William House published a series describing the endolymphatic sac shunt. Similar to Portman's procedure described earlier in 1962, Dr. House would open the mastoid, decompress the posterior fossa, and open the endolymphatic sac. Instead of just opening it, he would place a film or tube into the lumen in an attempt to keep it open. In subsequent papers, he refined his technique and reported great success in treating vertigo and preserving hearing. Meniere's disease and the moon. So what does Meniere's disease have to do with the moon? Um, in 1961, Alan Shepard became a national hero when he became the first American in space. He unfortunately developed Meniere's disease in 1963 and was grounded from further flights. Conservative therapy was not helpful. 
He had heard of the work of William House and in 1968 went to the House Clinic where he had a shunt procedure. His symptoms improved and in 1971, he flew with Apollo 14 to the moon. Dr. House reportedly spoke to Dr. Shepard during the flight and Shepard is reported to have said, I am talking to you through the ear that you operated on, saying what a great success the shunt surgery was at preventing the dizziness and preserving his hearing. So now we're gonna shift into some of the more modern data talking about the endolymphatic sac and um, sac surgery for Meniere's disease. In 1981, Jens Thompson in Denmark published a famous and controversial randomized control trial for the shunt surgery in Meniere's disease. He randomized 30 patients to either shunt or mastoidectomy. The follow-up was performed at a different clinical site than surgery to avoid biasing responses from providers or patients. Here's a quote from the method section, um, noting that the patients were not aware that they were participating in a randomized control trial with a placebo arm. This paper was published after the Helinski Declaration of Human Rights, but the authors note that the study was designed and conducted prior to Denmark enacting those um, human rights and that having a truly placebo arm study was important in getting a meaningful result. Here are the results from that study. Um, the y-axis is vertigo scores with time on the x-axis. The white circles represent patients who had the shunt and black circles represent mastoidectomy or the placebo arm. You can see a big difference in both groups pre and post-op, which would suggest both mastoidectomy and shunt surgery were successful at treating vertigo and there was not a major difference between the two. The second graph here on the right demonstrates each patient's trajectory pre and post-op. You can see here that all 15 of the shunt patients improved and two of the 15 mastoid patients had worsened vertigo after surgery. In statistical analysis, the authors reported no difference between the two arms of the study and concluded that shunt surgery didn't work. The Thompson randomized control trial generated a lot of controversy when it was published in the decades to follow. There was significant debate about the ethics of performing a placebo surgery without adequate informed consent. There was also debate about the statistical methods used. Thompson notes in the original manuscript that there was a difference in vertigo control in the two groups, but that it was due to two of the 15 patients who had worsened symptoms in the placebo arm. And then if you exclude those two, that there was no difference. And Separate papers, Dr. Pillsbury and Dr. Welling both reevaluated the data presented in the original paper using other statistical methods. Welling found significant differences between the shunt and master groups in dizziness, tinnitus, and combined symptoms, with dizziness in differences in hearing approaching significance. Continuing on to the present day, here we discuss a recent meta analysis from 2014. As we have seen, there have been a number of different procedures done to treat Meniere's disease, and if you believe the historical literature, they were all fairly successful. In this meta-analysis, um, the authors compare sac decompression and mastoid shunt surgeries. The difference, for those of you who don't know, is that in a shunt procedure, the endolymphatic sac is opened and a foreign body is placed inside to keep it open, while a decompression surgery is to identify the sac and remove bone from around it, but not open it or um, insert any foreign body. Both decompression and shunt had an approximately 70 to 80% success rate across quite a few studies with um, a number of patients, and they were not significantly different from each other. This group in China has been doing endolymphatic duct blockage surgery rather than decompression or shunt. Um, in that surgery, they exposed the endolymphatic sac and duct and place a surgical clip across the endolymphatic duct, blocking flow of endolymph um, through it. They did a randomized control trial comparing the two, comparing endolymphatic um, blockage to decompression. And they found that in their hands, blockage was far more successful. What I find a little concerning about this data is the lack of even a placebo response in their de decompression arm of the study. Prior studies have found 50 to 70% effectiveness of any procedure, including PE tubes, and they found a 70% failure rate with decompression versus a 95% success rate with their um, blockage. There have been a few subsequent studies of endolymphatic duct blockage that have been closer to the 70 to 80% success rate seen in other studies. 
in putting together this presentation, I found it so interesting to see how many different procedures have been attempted for many years, with so many of them reporting a meaningful improvement of symptoms. It seems that it doesn't matter what you do to the endolymphatic system, about two thirds of patients with Meniere's disease will improve with an intervention. It would be an interesting to study to just perform anesthesia and see if something about anesthetic rather than the procedure itself could help patients with Meniere's disease. Um, another retrospective study out of the University of Washington um, here examined outcomes of shunt patients versus intratympanic gentamicin patients. Patients were not randomized, but they had two clinicians at their center, one of whom offered shunt surgery for medical failure and the other offered intratympanic gentamicin. There was probably a different referral pattern, but the paper serves as a nice touch point comparing two different treatment modalities with an approximately equivalent 70% success rate. The hearing worsened in both groups, but more so in the intratympanic gentamicin group. Notably, the gentamicin group had about a 30% rate of chronic unsteadiness, which was not seen in the shunt group. In recent years, they were- hey, Robin? Yes, sir. If I may interrupt, uh, so the concept of general anesthesia for treatment of Meniere's disease was actually raised by George Gates, similar to what you just proposed. Um, right. And apparently he, he did that study, but he never published the results, which in my mind means that it probably didn't work. He took patients with Meniere's disease, put them in the uh, recovery room, gave them anesthesia, and then woke them up after like five minutes. Um, yeah. but it was never published, so I don't know whatever happened to it. Hmm. Yeah, I wonder what, uh, what drug, like it, it, it's a big can of worms about what drugs you use, the duration of anesthesia. Um, it, that is interesting to hear, yeah. Um, back to the um, talk here. So in recent years, there have been more conversation about migraine as a potential cause of their confounder of Meniere's disease. Um, this study by Orabi looked at shunt patients with and without migraine and found a non-significant difference between the two groups regarding surgical success, with non-migraine patients doing slightly better. Those with migraine had more psychiatric comorbidity. Um, another recent study was trying to predict success with shunt surgery um, and found overall 66% success in improving vertigo. They found no significant demographics or prior therapies um, able to predict success in um, shunt surgery. So far, the existing literature has been un unable to improve patient selection for shunt surgery or to try to determine ahead of time which patients would succeed and which would be left with persistent vertigo. With this in mind, I wanted to look at the house clinic experience with SAC surgery. Here's the data from the house group over the past 10 years. Um, there were nearly 12,000 patient visits for Meniere's with over 2,300 unique um, patient visits. Over this period, the team at house performed one or more IT dex injections in 156 of those patients and performed 142 end lymphatic sac surgeries, accounting for 6% of the patients seen with a diagnosis of Meniere's disease. Overall, 50% of patients had a meaningful improvement in their dizziness, having no dizziness or mild dizziness. An additional 18% had moderate dizziness after surgery, meaning they still had some dizziness that impacted their quality of life and continued to, continue to pursue medical therapies or IT dexamethasone or a referral to migraine specialist. Overall, only 23% of patients failed um, after a shunt surgery, going on to re require um, ablative therapy, including IT gentamicin, vestibular nerve section, or labyrinthectomy. For the purpose of this talk, um, these patients who went on to be offered ablative therapy were considered treatment failures of shunt. While several patients were from out of town and had very little follow-up, the majority of the patients had a long period of follow-up in this study. And the following analysis can include all patients to maximize the sample size, um, but note that repeat analysis on only those with one year and two year data had very similar results. In this table, we look at the demographics of those getting sac surgery. The red column highlights those who failed treatment, meaning they were offered or received destructive therapy after persistent, for persistent dizziness after surgery. There were no significant differences in the rate of failure for gender, race, or side of ear operated on. We can see that compared to younger adults, those age 75 or greater did significantly worse with a 50% failure rate after surgery. 
This is a statistically significant and a clinically significant finding and should be kept in mind when counseling patients or choosing patients for surgery. In this table, we examine what treatments were attempted prior to sex surgery, again, trying to understand who would have a good outcome afterwards and who would fail and go on to require more invasive treatment. Betahistine, diuretics, and migraine medications did not seem to predict failure after shunt surgery. Interestingly, intratympanic dexamethasone did. In our series, if a patient tried and failed intratympanic dexamethasone before undergoing end lymphatic sac surgery, they were more likely to succeed in achieving vertical control than a patient who did not receive IT steroids prior to surgery. This finding was statistically significant. For those who tried and failed IT dex, 84% had a good result, compared to just 68% of those who never had IT steroids prior to surgery. The retrospective nature of our study design makes it difficult to speculate as to the exact reason why we are seeing this. One possibility has to do with patient selection. Those patients who are offered and completed IT steroids may have been um, had a different variant of Meniere's disease than those who did not. In the past 10 years, there have been eight different surgeons um, operating at the house clinic, and they all have different practice patterns, which may also have an impact. In a separate analysis not shown here, there was, were some differences in success seen between the different surgeons, which trended towards, but were not quite significant. Over the 10 year time period, patients were more likely to be offered IT DEX, but in a separate analysis, um, IT steroids are significant, but the year in which surgery was performed is not. Another possible explanation would be to blame the natural history of Meniere's disease, that symptoms will resolve with time regardless of treatment. Those who received one or more IT injections had a longer time between disease onset and surgery, and the natural disease history of the disease may um, be more likely to take its course um, if their surgery was delayed, um, leading to a um, remission of symptoms. With this data, we simply cannot say, but it is an interesting finding. In my future practice, I'll be sure to offer IT steroids before considering endolymphatic sac surgery. I wanted to see if we could learn anything else from this data. I'm lucky enough to be married to a wonderful woman and mother who, among many other things, completed her PhD in machine learning while I was a resident. I was curious if a machine learning model could help us predict success or failure with shunt surgery. I'll briefly, briefly describe the methods here. You'll have to forgive me for not being the expert on this particular methodology. In machine learning, you can decide on the features or variables that you want to include in the model. For our case, we have the outcome of interest, um, which is severe persistent dizziness after shunt surgery. And we use the same demographic and medication variables to try to train the machine learning algorithm to be able to predict the outcome of interest based on the input variables. The data is divided into training and testing data sets. The training data set is used to create a predictive model, and then the testing data set is used to see how accurate the created model was. Here are the results of the machine learning model. The receiver operator curve here on the left shows the rate of true positive versus false positives, or the sensitivity and specificity of the test. A perfect test would follow this green line, meaning it has 100% sensitivity and specificity, or an AUC of 1.0. The yellow line here shows what it would look like if the test was no better than a coin flip at determining the result of interest for an AUC of 0.5. For our data, the algorithm resulted in an AUC of 0.66, in determining whether or not somebody would do well or continue to have dizziness after shunt surgery. This is a significant result. However, it's not a strong enough predictor of success to use meaningfully in a clinical setting. Next question is, can we learn anything else using the machine learning model? By running the model multiple times, eliminating one or more feature at a time, you can compare the AUC or the predictive power of the model. Variables that don't matter will not meaningfully change the AUC value, while variables that do matter will lower the AUC if they are removed from the model. You can see, just like in our simple two-way analysis, that IT dexamethasone was important in predicting success with shunt surgery. Interestingly, beta histine was also found to be meaningful to the machine learning model um, whereas in the chi square testing we did earlier, beta histone did not seem to be significant. Of modest success in predicting were the pre-op hearing class and the affected ear and age, and 
and significant features included race, gender, and diuretic use. We have, we've talked about dizziness outcomes after surgery, but we haven't yet talked about hearing. On the left here are hearing classes before surgery, and on the right are hearing classes after surgery. Hearing class is a combination of pure tone average or volume level someone can hear and word recognition score or ability to understand speech. Hearing class is used in research to simplify the interpretation of hearing outcomes. Class A shown in green is excellent hearing. Class B shown in yellow is good hearing, which is considered still serviceable. Class C is poor hearing and class D is very poor hearing. You can see overall, there's not a big change in the numbers of people with good and bad hearing after shunt surgery. However, nine out of 55 of the patients with non-serviceable hearing actually had their hearing improved to be serviceable after surgery. This is a great result. However, eight of the patients with serviceable hearing before surgery had worsening of the hearing to the point where it was non-serviceable after surgery. Part of the definition of Meniere's disease is fluctuating hearing. So like all studies on Meniere's, it is hard to make meaningful conclusions, but it is important to note that about 15% of patients with serviceable hearing before surgery had worsening of hearing afterwards to the point where it was non-serviceable. Patients should be counseled appropriately regarding this risk. On the flip side, about 15% of those with non-serviceable hearing before surgery had meaningful improvement. We've been talking about sac surgery failures as the primary outcome. I thought it would be worthwhile to describe what happened in those patients after their sac surgery. You can see here that eight patients were offered destructive therapies, but declined to complete them. Our group did an equal number of IT gentamicin and vestibular nerve sections and a few labyrinthectomies. Several patients had multiple treatments after shunt failure for persistent dizziness. In our series, there were no major complications. There was one post-op fever, which was treated with antibiotics. Two patients reported echoing sounds afterwards and one was treated for patchula cessation tube. Interestingly, one patient was found to have an incidental six millimeter vestibular schwannoma on the contralateral side. This has been followed and stable over four years of follow-up. So we have discussed what is Meniere's disease, how common it is, and we have reviewed a number of treatments that have been tried for over the past 300 years. This slide summarizes our current treatment algorithm for Meniere's disease here at House Clinic. Once someone is diagnosed, they are advised to adhere to a low salt and low caffeine diet. Many patients will be offered diuretics and or beta histine. If there's a history of migraine, we will try to optimize their migraine management of diet supplements and or medications. We sometimes offer oral steroids for flare-ups of Meniere's disease. In my admittedly short career, I would say the majority of people will have an adequate response to these non-invasive medical therapies. In patients that are still suffering with dizzy spells, we will then offer intratympanic steroid injections. Many patients will have a good response to these injections. If not, they can be offered an endolymphatic sac surgery, which in our series and in others has about a 70 to 80% success rate at controlling vestibular symptoms. If that fails, we can offer destructive therapy such as intratympanic gentamicin, vestibular nerve section, or labyrinthectomy. Sac surgery, like many of the other treatments that have been tried in the past 150 years, is controversial in our field. Given the natural history of Meniere's disease, where many patients will spontaneously improve without any therapy at all, it is hard to do a perfect clinical trial to prove or disprove the effect of any given treatment. Practice patterns vary widely across the US and in the world for Meniere's disease, and there's not a consensus about what constitutes the best management algorithm. At the end of the day, we aren't sure what causes the endolymphatic hydraps seen in Meniere's disease, which makes identifying the appropriate treatment difficult. I came across this quote from a Dr. Huang in Taiwan. Um, he published in 2002 on his experience with over 3,000 endolymphatic sac surgeries. I think it summarizes the thinking of many proponents of endolymphatic sac surgery fairly well. And I'm quoting here, the simple fact is that when medical treatments fail to provide relief from incapacitating symptoms, perhaps due to a weaker medical placebo effect, sufferers can count on a high probability of complete or substantial multi-year relief through conservative safe surgery. Hence, in the author's mind, there can be no doubt that the advisability of surgery when all else fails, irrespective of whether placebo effect may be involved. Conclusions. Um, Meniere's disease is a challenging clinical problem without a perfect solution. 
and lymphatic sac surgery has been performed for nearly 100 years with some success, although it remains controversial. Patient selection is important. Um, be sure to exhaust other treatment options. Um, older adults have worse results and offer IT steroid injections prior to offering surgery. Patients without surf with serviceable hearing should be counseled without a 15% risk of hearing loss afterwards.